um, I started working with Magnolia Manor about four years ago. I was in education and, and uh, was the head of school and, and coached for 15 years. So I usually don't need a mic. Most people hear me from, uh, but it's good to have it. And it's great to be here in God's house this morning visiting with y'all. And um, I do want to tell you just a little bit about Magnolia Manor before I get started. Um, I am over our communications department. And uh, we do uh, everything from our fundraising to our grant writing to um, we're over all of our chaplains who we have chaplains on all nine of our campuses. And um, we, um, uh, we do all of our commercials. We do everything in-house, so we stay busy. But it's, uh, it's good to be with Magnolia Manor. Um, I did join it in the middle of the pandemic. So um, if you've been in health care, you're in health care, you understand it's been a challenge for us. But um, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we're seeing things start to turn around. So we're certainly happy about that. But we do have nine campuses. A lot of times people don't know that. We have nine campuses. Um, we started in America's Georgia, and that's where our home office is and where I work out of. Uh, but we uh, expanded from, we started in 1963 and expanded to Macon, Georgia in 1983. But we have campuses uh, in Columbus, Buena Vista, Macon, Americas, and Moultrie. And then we go over on the coast. We have campuses at St. Mary's, St. Simon's, Richmond Hill, and Midway. Uh, we uh, employ uh, a little over 900 people, and we take care of about 1,200 residents. So uh, we are certainly thankful for uh, our foundation uh, with the Methodist Church and the church's support and your individual support. That goes a long way. That support uh, that we get goes to our uh, benevolent arm, uh, the League of the Good Samaritan, and what that does is it helps us fund uh, our, our pastors on all nine campuses or our chaplains. And then it also uh, it keeps a promise that our founders made uh, over 60 years ago when we opened up that uh, no one would ever have to leave Magnolia Manor if they outlive their financial means. So thank you for your support. It goes a long ways, and we certainly appreciate that. But I'm going to move on into the message this morning, and, and um, our vice president for uh, church relations is Henry Bass. Some of you may know Henry. He's a retired Methodist preacher. He's a district superintendent, and uh, he's one of my mentors. And um, he told me, he said, Ty, uh, when you go to speak, don't forget the three B's. I said, well, what are they, Mr. Henry? He said, be sincere be short and be seated. I said, yes, sir. I'll try to, I'll try to do that. So uh, thank goodness you got a clock up there on the wall so to keep me in line. But also it's uh, great for me to have my wife here, uh, Laura uh, Lanier Kinslow. Uh, we'll celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary um, July 1st. I don't forget that. And uh, we have two uh, children. Uh, our son Banks uh, lives in Auburn, Alabama. And with his wife, Hart, and they have our six-month-old grandson. So we're proud grandparents now, and there's nothing like grandchildren. I can promise you that. And then I, we have a daughter who just graduated her master's in Augusta, Georgia, and she's fixing to be an occupational therapist. So uh, we're proud of our two children and thankful for them, and especially the grandson. <laughs> but we're going to be in Exodus this morning, and... Um, the verses um, in Exodus uh, will be in chapter 14, 10 through 16, 23 through 25, and then finish it up with 31. <clears throat> I'm going to read those verses real quick. So in Exodus 14, 10 through 16, many of you know this part of it. It's uh, where the Egyptians are chasing the Israelites, Pharaoh and the Egyptians with the Red Sea. And so many of us know the story of the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. So uh, here we go. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us in the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people. He said, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. 
You only need to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I'm going to skip down to 23. It says, The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of the chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them and against Egypt. And then in verse 31, it goes on to say, and when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him. So we can see that in Exodus, it is the exciting story of God's guidance. God led Moses and the nation of Israel out of Egypt, and he wants to lead us as well. But like the Israelites, sometimes I find it easy to complain and be dissatisfied at my situation. You know, some things just aren't going the way I want them to go, you know, and we have to realize that the world just doesn't revolve around me, just doesn't revolve around you. You know, things aren't going to always go. But even though they don't, as Christians, and we have struggles, we shouldn't ever just sit there and, and complain and, and, and be unpleasant. And, and, you know, we need to trust God and we need to trust him completely. So let me just take you back real quick and let's just um, think what it would be like. As those uh, Egyptians and Pharaoh were just coming down there with the, can't you just hear those hoofbeats pounding and the chariots wheels squealing and you're the Israelites down there, you think, oh my goodness, this is it. This is it. We're doomed. They're coming to get us. There's nowhere to go. You know, but, so in verse 10 through 12, it says, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up and there the Egyptians were marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It'd been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die. So, <clears throat> you know, the panic was setting in. Have you ever been in a situation where panic just starts to set in? I know I have. Well, I get worked up, I get hot, I get sweaty, I, I, I'm not sure what to do. Um, you know, sometimes I start complaining, maybe whining a little bit, and, you know, <clears throat> we shouldn't do that. We should look back and think about, you know, God's powerful hand has delivered me time and time again. But like the Israelites, sometimes we don't completely trust God. And we don't completely trust God. Sometimes it's, it's that faith is called what I like to call show me faith. Ah, show it, prove it to me. I know as a kid growing up, sometimes, you know, we'd be saying, hey, I can do this or I can do that. And, you know, finally someone said, ah, prove it to me. Show it. Show me. You know, and that's sort of what the uh, Israelites you know, they weren't thinking what God had done for them before. They were saying, hey, I, 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 I don't have complete trust. And, you know, several times uh, in life um, and many times we're going to be like the Israelites. We haven't faced a life and death situation. And, um, and when we haven't fa faced that life and death situation, there have been other trials or adversities that we have faced. And I call those Red Sea moments. When we face a, a trial or adversity. And back on August the 23rd of this past year, uh, 2023, I was diagnosed with neck and throat cancer. Even though I had never uh, dipped or smoked. Um, and on September the 19th, um, I started, I had to go to Atlanta. And they told me, and my doctor said, we got to get you to Emory, Ty. We got to get you to Atlanta. And went up there, and, and after meeting with them on September the 19th, I started um, 
seven weeks I was going to have to live in Atlanta, Laura and I. And um, for seven weeks, every day, Monday through Friday, I'd have radiation on my neck and throat. <clears throat> and then on every Tuesday, after the radiation, I would go up there and it'd be anywhere from four to five hours. Uh, I'd have a chemo treatment. So for, I had a chemo treatment for seven weeks. And I, uh, once a week and had 35 radiations. Um, I lost 26 pounds in three weeks. Um, I've never been so happy to get a feeding tube put in. Uh, when I got that feeding tube put in, my weight uh, just uh, it leveled out. <clears throat> and uh, because for six weeks, my throat was so messed up, I could not eat anything for three weeks. I didn't drink anything. Everything went through my feeding tube. Um, <clears throat> Thankful for that feeding tube, but after having it for three months, I was thankful for getting it out also. But, you know, some of you may not have faced a, a situation like that. Some of you face situations worse than that. Um, but we're either have been in a trial, you're in one now, or you're going to be in one. But really and truly, we've been in all three of those areas. We've been in all three of those areas, you know, and some of the trials that people have are employment or maybe unemployment or, or health conditions. Uh, you may have had some other type of health condition. Um, I know um, dealing with your children growing up, you know, dealing with your children, a lot of situations there. Um, financial crisis, I know things have been tough. Uh, marriage, marriage situations, you know, the problems go on and on. But what I call Red Sea moment is when our faith is just not a theory or a talk. We just aren't talking about our faith. But it's a living, breathing reality that you're facing something. And I tell you what, so many times I've tried to face some of these situations and put it in my own hands, as, especially as a uh, a coach and an educator, I can get this done. I can handle this. I can make this situation better. Well, I tell you what, when I went to Emory, the Winship Cancer Institute, it was out of my hands. It was out of my hands. And I um, used to tell uh, my players, say, you got to be coachable. You got to be coachable. You got to listen. You got to do what we ask you to do. You got to be coachable. Sometimes you have to sacrifice for other people. You know, and I told those doctors up there, I said, hey, I've been a coach for a long time, but now I'm the player. I said, you're the coach and I'm going to be coachable. Uh, but we know our ultimate coach. That's a good Lord. That's a good Lord, our ultimate coach. And, you know, this was a situation I couldn't uh, I couldn't put in my own hands. I had to listen. I had to do what they said to do. Um, a lot of times when you put things in your own hands, it just brings on more anxiousness and worry. You know, I think I can do it. Uh, then I get caught up in that. And I, I, I you know, I got to trust God and I got to trust him completely. You know, I need to focus on what God has done in the past for me, how he's brought me out of situations before. And then I can face whatever crisis or adversity or trial I'm going through. I can face that with confidence instead of that whining, that fear, that complaining. You know, the Israelites, you know, uh, they started that whining and fear. They couldn't, re they didn't remember. You know, we need to remember what God's done for us in the past. And we're going to slip on uh, Moses' sandals real quick and look at re uh, verses 13 and 14 again. Moses answered the people. He said, do not be afraid, stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. I tell you what, in verse 13 right there, uh, what I like about that, it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm. What's he doing? He's encouraging them. He's encouraging them. And I can tell you what, those seven weeks I was in Atlanta, Georgia at, at Emory, um, I had a lot of people praying for me. A lot of people texting me, sending me cards. Uh, just, uh, uh, it, it's amazing the encouragement that Laura and I and, and my children, that we all felt from friends, family, even people I didn't even know. I'll see them now and say, hey, 
I was praying for, they were introduced themselves, said, hey, I heard about your situation. I was praying for you. And I think that's one of the greatest things that can ever be said about a person is an encourager. In the uh, children's lesson, building people up. Building people up. Isn't that what God calls us to do? To build relationships, encourage other people. And then in verse 14, and I'm sorry, now you know I have to drink a lot. Once you have that radiation done, it sort of kills you some of your saliva glands. So I get sort of dry. Mm. But in verse 14, it says, uh, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to what? Be still. Be still. I tell you what, that, that, that goes against when I'm trying to do it in my own hands. I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying, I'm worried about everything. Think I need to be still. I need to be still. And what I think that means is be focused, be locked in. And when I was coaching basketball, um, so we, for every game, we'd know the game plan. We'd know the other team's strengths and weaknesses. We knew what we had to do. We had to be focused. We had to be focused. There's no other way that I could tell, tell you that I think it's a better way to get focused and be still as every morning. Sit before the Lord, reading scripture, prayer, meditating, be still because I know adversity is coming. I'm a, I got a pretty good idea what I got to do today. But I tell you what, something's always coming up. Something's always coming up and you never know. It may just be a little bitty ripple wave or it may be a big Titanic wave out there, but it's coming, you know. And that's why if I've got before the Lord that morning, I'm ready. I'm focused. I'm still. I try to get with him and meditate on his word. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 58, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There it is again, stand firm. Instead of show me faith, that's what I call stand and see faith. Watch God. Have complete trust in him. Watch and see what he can do for you. And then I like it says, always give yourselves fully to the Lord. It doesn't say partially. We know what God, we know what the Bible says about lukewarm Christians, don't we? We know what it says about that. Uh, he says, give yourself fully to the Lord. And I know when we're coaching, you know, it, 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 if we have a game plan, but we really, we're not going by it, we're not paying attention, you know, we're probably not going to win. Probably not going to win. And God says, give yourself fully to the Lord. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, it says, be on your guard. Here it is again, stand firm in the faith. Stand and see. Then it goes on to say, be courageous and strong. Do everything in love. Do everything in love. Now I like that. It says, be courageous and strong. I tell you, um, <clears throat> when you're going through uh, a, a trial and adversity, you know, when I was going through cancer, um, be courageous and strong. Now, as a coach, and, and I played a lot of ball growing up, not real big, so I used to think I was pretty, had to be pretty tough, you know, and I used to tell my players, I said, um, you know, you can't be physically tough until you're mentally tough. Physically, I can give out, but mentally, I can make myself push through. Mentally tough. There's a lot of things I talk about being a mentally tough player. But I was uh, really uh, sort of down. I tell you what, when you're losing that kind of weight and you're seeing your body sort of wither away a little bit, um, uh, I sat on the bed and, and um, Laura and I, we would uh, study the word and, and pray. And, and um, I got to think, I said, you know what? If I ever coached again, I said, I messed up. I said, I told them you couldn't be physically tough until you're mentally tough. I said, I let, left the main one out that I learned through cancer. You can't be mentally tough until you're physically tough, and you can't be mentally tough until you're spiritually tough. Do you have the guts to get up every morning and be tough enough to study God's word and stand up for him when it counts? You know, 
spiritually tough in a lot of different ways, but studying God's word, being in the word, sharing with other people, doing what's right. There's a saying that I like to say, you can't do what's right till you believe what's right. You got to believe, you got to believe. And I tell you what, um, at night it said, uh, be courageous and strong, do everything in love. And my wife did everything in love during this time, still does. But I tell you, um, you know, I, I, I sat on the edge of that bed one night talking about tough. And I told her, I said, um, I used to think I was tough, but I, I, this is maybe more than I can handle. And she said, are you ready to quit? She didn't know that made me mad. <laughs> That's the coaching competitor came out in me. I said, uh, I just sort of said, you know what? I got to get more spiritually tough, you know, but that made me fight even harder. That made me fight even harder. And she was doing that in love. <clears throat> now, there are times uh, when we have that stand and see faith. We got to completely trust God. We've relied on God completely to give us directions. And then there are times when he says, it's time to move. It's time to get going. And in verse 15 and 16, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. So he said, Hey, you've prayed about it. You've got faith in me. Move. It's time to do something. And that's why when I was going through all this, and so many times I wanted to have a pity party. You know, I want to feel, but I said, hey, that's not what God wants. Keep having faith. I had to get up. The times I didn't want to get out of that bed, sometimes I didn't do anything to get, but get out of the bed and go down there to cancer, uh, the Winship Cancer Institute and come home. But I tell you what, you got to get up. When you've prayed about it and you know what God wants you to do, then move. Move and act. You know, and this is one of the reasons I tell you, you can't just lay around, can't sit around all the time because we know the devil is all around in our fallen world. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that Satan walks around like a, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may de devour. He walks around like a lion seeking whom he, who, what's the lion doing? He's looking around seeing who's sort of lazy, not doing anything. You know, he wants us to get out. He wants us to build relationships. He wants us to be an encourager. And in the first John 4, 4, it proclaims that God who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's greater than Satan, the God who is in you. <clears throat> and I tell you, in, in uh, Psalm 32, 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. That's a great reminder that God will lead us if we put our faith and trust completely in him. He's going to take care of us. You know, God's our way maker. He's our miracle worker. He's our promise keeper. And he's our light in the darkness. You know, I tell you, um, I can promise you that the storms of life are going to come at you. They're going to come at you. And you're going to feel those waves just crashing on, crashing on you. And when those waves are pounding against you, you need to put that foot deep in that sand and stand strong. Stand and see what God can do for you. And we can be just like Moses. We can make a difference in other people's lives with our stand and see faith, our unwavering faith. And our, unwave, our unwavering faith causes us to have a great attitude. And it causes us to have a great attitude at all times, even when those waves of doubt keep crashing on us. Because we know that Jesus wins. He's going to win. We know that. He's going to win. And so how do you handle life's trials? How do you handle life's adversity? You know, um, so many times uh, we got to do something about it, but we don't need to put it all in our hands. We need to go to God. We need to get focused on him. But Joshua 1, 9, verses so many of you know, is great instructions. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. 
Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Isn't it great to know that he's going to never leave us or forsake us? So as a child of God, we need to stand firm in our faith, no matter what we face. So I just ask you, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Now bow your heads with me. I'll close this in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we just thank you for the chance to just come and share your word. I thank you for First Methodist here in Tifton, Georgia. Father, I thank you for all the people who are here today and just be with their family and friends. And Father, just let us, no matter what comes at us, no matter what wave is hitting us, just let us stand firm and keep our eyes on you. Father, we'd love you and thank you for loving us. We ask all of this in your son's most precious name. Amen.